So hi and welcome to the next episode of the Foss North Pod. Today we have Alex with us. So uh, could you please start by telling telling us a bit about yourself? Why are you here? <laughs> I'm here. I don't know. There was my mother and father once met. I don't know. <laughs> I I am uh, I'm Alex. I work on Linux stuff. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for the last twenty years or so, doing uh, desktop work. Uh, the last four or five years, I've been working on Flatpak, which is why I'm here to talk about that. But I have a very like long history in open source, and I've been li Linux users since 1994 or something. And how, how did you get started? Like everything? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, we don't have to go back to mom and dad, but... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I guess it started in school when we I was, I was uh, in high school. We 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 I did a I went to a special school where they had some workstations that we were using, and I was like I really wanted to have a Linux at home, so or or a Unix I guess I, I wanted a Solaris or Sun OS back then, but I found Linux instead and like did my own Linux and then like went on from there from just using it to eventually being a developer using. Uh, so you missed the CD that got you started with uh, Gnome. Oh, no, no. It was all floppies <laughs> back then. <laughs> yeah, it's like bike to school and get get the uh, the Emacs series of floppies and like 14 floppies and it's all at home. Yeah. One of them is broken and you have to bicycle yeah. back. I, and to, I, I, I know that. Have two of everyone. So <laughs> I had a backup. I think I have them. No, they're out of picture. I have my floppy boxes there, but I have an unopened HD double density pack. Yeah. If, Those if are going to be worth need. a lot of money. I mean, eventually. it's, it's like, four, 14 megabytes. It's amazing. Yeah. I used to think that the uh, commands to write to the flop was so, so hard to learn. So I, I used cat uh, to dev FD0, I think it was, on on the Solaris. Instead of DD? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it worked. I mean, I guess it works. Yep. DD is uh, mainly useful for hmm. tar or, or archives, like tapes anyway. I think it's cat is fine for a device like a floppy. Yeah. Anyway, so I mean, I guess my um, my initial entrance into the GNOME world was I I wrote this tool called Dia or Dia or how you want to pronounce yeah. it. It's this uh, GTK app for diagramming stuff that I did as part of you know wanting to do diagrams in some university level like UML course or something. So didn't have anything like that, so I wrote that one, and then I kind of got into the whole GNOME world. Attended. And then we're talking like late 90s or something like that. Or... Yeah, like 1999. I went to the first Guadec, the GNOME conference in 2000. Uh, that's where I met a lot of the people first. And then I worked on a couple of years doing embedded Linux uh, in a company in Linshaping. But then I got hired by, by Red Hat 2000. And well, since then, yeah. I've been basically at the, the desktop team at, at Red Hat doing I was the Nolus maintainer for a while. I was part of the like the initial work on the GTK2 Dbus. I've been doing a lot of work on GTK. Did the the Broadway backend for GTK, and eventually ended up doing a bunch of work on uh, Docker, also, as well as Flatpak and other similar application distribution systems. Yeah, I, I guess Flatpak is your baby, even. I mean, you started this XDG app back in the yeah when but even, C even, groups even, and the namespacing and everything sort of became available to to some extent. Yeah, yeah. And XDG app is basically Flatpak with a, the older name. But even before yeah. that, uh, I, I was working on a similar uh, patching system, but that that were more experimental. But. I, I, I think everything caught up when uh, enough technology was robust, like to do Docker and Flatpak and all that kind of stuff. But so Flatpak is is sort of a it's an application container, 
to 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 isolate and run applications separately and it's also a distribution format and you have the flatpak hub could you could you do like a, a whirlwind tour of of, of yeah, what it so is the, and what you need so uh, uh, it's it's an application distribution and deployment system meaning it both it's both a way to download the app and, and dependencies and whatnot and keeping it updated uh, as well as running it locally like it, it's it's a runtime environment uh, for for an application that looks the same independent on what kind of distribution you run it on right so so from the app point of view it exposes a standardized layout for the environment that you can work in and and from the side of of the host operating system it also is, is a standardized you can run flatpak this thing and it looks like a regular process so it's kind of sits in between and acts as a well a container but but some, something that isolates the application from the host and it, the isolation is some people focus on the security aspect of isolation. Uh, it's definitely important. I mean, the, the fact that Flatpak has a sandbox that that long term allows us to have a very secure system where the applications aren't necessarily allowed to access other apps or, or host system data. But isolation is also what's making it possible to run the same app on many systems. Like it's it's. It's both a security thing and an implementation detail in how we actually do containers. But it, it sounds as if, as if you're saying that the distribution problem is the primary problem that you try to solve. And, and having isolation is something that you need to be able to do that because you need to run the applications in sort of various runtime environments or... So the, so the, primary, so the primary problem I'm trying to solve is, is, is on a much larger scale. Like if, if you are a free software developer working on something that you want your users or some users to use, the goal of Flatpak is to make that a, an experience that works, right? You should be in control of getting your app to the user. And, and the, the feedback you get from users should be for the thing you put out there at the time you choose to put it out. That's that, that's the top level goal of, of Flatpak too, because in the current system that's not how it works. There's always an intermediate. A lot of people like think that the distros do a lot of good work in actually packaging and stuff, and it, it's not entirely wrong that they help a lot in packaging stuff, but it's also a point of failure for 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 the developer to interact with the users, right? It takes forever until it's picked up. And they choose to package it the wrong way, or, or they're arbitrary freezing dependencies. So, so the the goal of Flatpak is to kind of kickstart the community around producing desktop applications that like work, that compete with other platform systems instead well, of being we, stuck in like the distro world. Where, where would you say the distros? start and end and sort of ideally because right now i mean it, it is a problem that you might sort of get bugs for dia reported into debian's systems and you as a developer sort of need to figure out all the sources of information and stuff like that but does it mean that distros in the end is something that you envision will disappear or oh or no i i think i think uh, the opposite is true i think i think the fact that to be a viable distribution today, you have to package the world. Being every fringe, like if, if you want to use a distribution, it better have the apps you want, and everyone wants different apps. Thus, for an, a distribution to be viable, it has to package everything. And that's just fundamentally not a very interesting thing to be in the business of packaging everything. I mean, we should have, like, the less people that have to spend all the time packaging everything, the the more they can focus on interesting stuff, such as like a distribution can be so much. Like you can do so many cool new things to create a new distro. But it's hampered by the fact that to do a distro, you have to start by packaging 50,000 apps. So that, so, so you can, the yeah. only thing you can run is Debian, Ubuntu, or I, don't, I mean, there are other things, but basically you have to have this massive 
projects to recompile the world when what you really wanted to do was, you know, have some new ID or, 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 or integrate with the desktop in a, in a new way or whatever. Like there, there's so much focus on packaging application that I think is, is, shouldn't be the thing that distributions are interested in. <laughs> the, uh, so it's, it's of course the trust issue here. The um, so if I download, uh, by the way, what are the packages called? Are they called flat packs? Yeah, that's really a, not a great terminology. I call them flat packs because that's a really okay. better way. So there's runtimes and apps, uh -huh. and, but 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 it would be like flat packs. Yes. Yeah, so the how do I trust a package? Can I like? Is it a verification? Trust, trust, in in what sense do you want to trust it? <sighs> that it is what it, it is, or or that it doesn't <laughs> do something. That it doesn't tamper with my hardware or other software. But because there's this different thing, right? You do you trust that is if it claims to be Minecraft, that do you trust that it is Minecraft and not someone else re-implementing it? Or did, I'm too old to play games, but I, I, I do get your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but if I do a download or install from Red Hat, Fedora, Debian, or what have you, then I'm then I, I, I I've sort of made a choice that I, I trust you guys to do that. Yeah. So is there a similar way must yeah, so, be to use the flat pack hub? Yeah, so 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 flat pack is intentionally not really tied to a specific ecosystem. Uh, I think it's important then that, ev that everyone is on on like the same uh, on a level playing where you, where you can compete. If if you want to have your own distribution mechanism, if you want to ship your app on your servers, you should be completely fine with that. However, everyone like that's kind of the old Windows style where you have to hunt for installers on different websites. It's, it's not really a great like end user experience. So, so in order to make the experience better, we do have this thing called Flat Hub, which is a central for flat packs. We're trying to make it be like the the main place where you find open source stuff. But it's not necessarily the only one, and it's in fact it's not even installed by default in 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 most uh, distributions packaging of of flat pack. So it's something you have to click on a file to install. Basically, add uh, something like an app repo or, or a jum repo. But once you have it, yes, you sort of trust that everything is on there. Like you, you trust the packages that we let push packages to uh, Flathub, which in a sense is is you know, the same the same level of trust that you would grant a distribution. Yeah. But how, how is Flatpak set up then? Is, is it like, do you use something like, uh, I'm thinking F-Droid, for instance, where, where what you trust is that the source is the correct source? Or, or do, you, do you actually do some additional checks and balances before you're allowed to to put your app in there uh looking for, for from the side of flat hub as, as an organization we have an initial uh, review like if if you uh, publish a new app it has to pass pass the review uh and uh but once that is in there we don't actually track uh, what you do and so even if like we have there were there is some kind of review on the initial package, then you are basically the maintainer, such as you would be of a, of a Debian package, and we don't look at whatever like updates, adds, and, and changes. I mean, it's quite similar to to what the the major app stores does, or for instance, Android. They, it well, takes a while quite... the first time, and then they do their more CIO like Android then. More like Fbroid, I think. Yeah, because Android actually do like I think uh, they run some kind of CI on every. New yeah, app. they test that the app starts and that it hasn't yeah, changed yeah. too much. But it, I mean, it, it it's only the first review that takes a couple of weeks, and then you can yeah. push instantly, basically. Yeah, so it's not. Yeah, it's not very dissimilar from that. But if if I want to get started, where the, let's say that I have an app and I want to to deploy it and package it and sort of close the loop where where do i start i i need a, a development environment i guess or, or some sort of runtime to build against it yeah so uh, like 
the first thing you have to do is package your app as a flat pack. And, and the first thing you do when you want to package something is, is pick what runtime it's, it's supposed to be based on. Uh, runtimes are something that, that flat pack has that supply the basic stuff your application needs. So it's shared between many different applications, both like shared in terms of uh, there's a single copy of it, but it's also like there's a, there's a separate project that shares maintenance of this thing so that not everyone has to do what, the boring work on glibc updates and whatnot. But you have to <clears throat> pick which runtime to use. And normally, what makes most sense is to pick either the KDE or the GNOME runtime. Both of those are based on top of us common uh, platform. So if your application is not very high level, like a game, you might want to use the base platform uh, runtime too, which is called Free Desktop SDK. There are other uh, runtimes also, like we're working on a RHEL based one and there's a Fedora one, but those are, at least the Fedora one is really more about reusing existing Fedora RPMs than it is about packaging a third party application. Uh, there, there is some interest in 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 making the rel ones be a, like a long term supported, fifty years of stability guaranteed, which is which is very dissimilar from the free desktop one. Uh, although you know, as always, when you have stable things, you know it's stable for fifteen years, but you know it's got to be pretty old after fifteen years. Yeah. So so, for 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 upstream things, I think it makes a lot more sense to be based on upstream uh, projects like free desktop or its derivatives. So once you pick which one you want to use, they come with an SDK, which is basically the runtime plus all the develop packages and the compilers and the debuggers and all the tools you need to do development. So you don't really need to have any development tools on your machine. In fact, it's really nice that you don't have because then everyone like if you have if you're multiple people working on the same project, you all will automatically be using the same build tools. And uh, if it, if it gets built on FlatHub, it's built using the same compiler as you. So there's no difference in in, in environment messing up with testing and stuff. Uh, so uh, once you pick that, you write a manifest. So there's a there's a Flatpak builder is a tool that builds uh, Flatpaks. Although, I mean, there are other ways, but that, that's the most common way. Uh, that and, and you basically specify the SDK, and then it's basically a list of URLs for the tarballs or the Git repositories and how to build them. So it's quite similar to any kind of packaging, with, with the main difference being that the end result is a single thing, whereas if you were packaging things, there is a tendency to break everything up into separate uh, packages. For, for everything. As you don't build your docs separate from your main program, well, so to speak. If you, if you depend on, on some library that is not part of the runtime, that gets into the manifest that builds the app rather than a separate you know, RPM or dev for that library or something. But, but, but in, in practice, there's not a lot of dependencies as most of the core stuff necessary for, for desktop apps are in the runtime. So it's more if you, if you have an app like a bad example, Lib Spotify or something like that. That yeah, you integrate like in here. Yeah. yeah. From a compliance point of view, I'm interested. Uh, so, for, for example, Docker is a pain in the butt. To if I ship like a, a vanilla Ubuntu, I'm then I'm also distributing all these packages. So there's a lot of like problems with that. So is that something you've looked into in, in Flatpak? Um, Basically, uh, can I get the copyright for all the uh, dependencies in there? Can I get the copyright holders, the license text? No, there's there's no there's no tracking of that. No, I mean there is in the sense that the free desktop people, like the free desktop SDK developers, do uh, track licenses and stuff, but there's no built-in tooling uh, to consume it. But I, I can yeah. potentially list the packages in a flat pack. No, no. Oh. Uh, you can look at the manifest and see what got built. Uh huh. So you okay. end up. 
So it's more like it's more like an archive of the the uh, build. Uh, there's not a lot of metadata about stuff that went into the build. So I guess it's very similar then to building well an Android and iOS app, where you yourself as an app developer is responsible for sort of showing in a prominent place whatever the license assists the the copyright of your dependencies. So yeah, yeah. and your do do you have like a an envelope license for the package itself, or it's not something that's relevant really? No, to it's, uh, it, there's no currently. Well, there is the uh, app stream uh, data, which can list JSON, or I mean, uh, which can list the JSON file that can list. No, actually, that XML that can, that can list licenses. Uh, but there's no tooling that like automatically generates that from the source. And it's all uh, it's actually somewhat complicated uh, because app streams, or or, or in general tooling in the free software community is based on uh, on a on this package perspective so something like an app stream which describes an application or describes a module would have a license field and a version field and whatnot which would be all right if you were describing the leaf package or the leaf rpm or like the, the spotify rpm but actually, when it's described in the entire app that has some things bundled in it, the semantics isn't quite there anymore. Like, what what is the license? Ex what part? What does the license field apply to? Is it? Yeah, exactly. Like, because you're doing things? almost a mini distro, almost yeah. like a subset so the, of a distro. It, it, so it's a license of a of a bundle of packages. Yeah. yeah, and you need to know how they are combined, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it's, it's, oh, okay. And okay, like the cool. version, like if you, if you have a version this of Spotify and it uses some version of libjson or lib, lib Spotify or whatever, how do you encode the combined version? There's really no, there's really no way to do that. So, so some of the tooling is, is kind of focused on the traditional packaging way. Oh, but that's interesting. I mean, if another aspect to it is really if you uh, if you build a flat pack, I guess you as a developer then is the one doing the distribution technically, even though it goes over in flat hub. Yeah. And then, but... then they're into gray zone. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, who, who's responsible for keeping the the sources up there? And I guess if yeah. if you were to if you put an LGPL library into a flat pack. Which is a binary distribution format. You're technically responsible then for sharing all the information that that your yeah. users can regenerate the package with that. I mean, we do kind of automatically uh, produce source version, like everything that when we were building the when we were building a manifest, we collect the sources that was used for that build automatically on FlatHub. But there's no guarantee. Like you could easily have a manifest that just lists a, a binary, and we, we like we don't have the sources for that. So so fundamentally, it's up to the end user that submits something to FlatHub. And and from from a from a legal point of view, that's kind of our standpoint that we just act as a way to distribute, you know, like Reddit or whatever. You get to stand for what you put in there. And if someone comes to us and says this actually contains something that is problematic or something we have copyright for or, or or just is illegal or whatever, then we will just delete it and say, well, we are just distribution someone else's work. Yeah. Because because as an organization like Flatpak is uh, Flat Hub cannot take the responsibility for everything. They just, just Yeah, I mean the, the, uh, if you don't do it that way, you run into the same scaling problem as as a distro, I guess, because then yeah. then you have to do all the work. And actually we <laughs> actually we want what we what we ideally want is for the actual application upstream maintainers to own their own things in Flatpak, in Flatup. I mean, if if someone wants to package someone else's app, that's currently uh, allowed. But we prefer uh, the actual upstream maintainer to do it. And if they if there's any always if if there's any kind of conflict, we always party with the upstream maintainer. 
So it's about getting closer or bringing the, the gap between the user and the upstream developer closer, basically. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious here. So was there a, a, like a, a specific moment a couple of years ago when you finally had it? I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of this dependency uh, like issue. So I'm, I'm going to write flat, flat back. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I've I've been like since I've been at Red Hat for twenty years. I've been in the distribution business and the packaging business for a long time. I know all about the problems it has. So I've I've always been, <laughs> you know, I always knew the problems. Uh, but it was more of a, a technical interest initially. Like I, I I wrote a tool called Glick. Which is kind of a pun on click, which is was an earlier like one file install, like you download a single click file and run it. And Glick is similar, but used some other which were then cutting edge kernel technologies to to implement containers. And and over time I kind of had an interest in that part of the kernel and different ways you can do that. And eventually that that API, the, the kernel container support, just got good enough that we could do a, a realistically do a, some production quality application framework. And that just fell out of that. Uh, one qu uh, thought that just came into my mind is that if I install like 20 apps, let, let's say that they all depend on Python version 2.7. And uh, <laughs> so th then I'll have like 22.7 install and I do an upgrade. So then I have to upgrade all the packages one by one. Well, first of all, uh, Python would no normally come from the, uh, from the runtime. So if, if all the apps were using the same runtime, they uh, would only like on, you'd only need to upgrade the runtime, and all the apps would automatically get the the new version. Uh, it might it may be that some apps are using the KDE runtime and some are using the GNOME one, but both of those are sharing the base runtime. <clears throat> so once that get, once that gets updated, and both the GNOME and KDE uh, gets rebased on top of the new one you get to update the KDE and the GNOME one. But due to the way we store files and the way we uh, manage updates of files, you would only download the file once. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the OS3 magic coming in there, yeah. deduplicating. So yeah, exactly. So, so OS3 would deduplicate any, any file that is so it's basically like like a Git repository. Like you, we check some every file, and if you have the file with a particular check some already locally, there's no need to download it again. We just use that. Copy. But that only applies to the runtimes, I guess. So so if if you have multiple applications that package the same library because they happen to use it and it's not in the runtime, that that would not be deduplicated it, it but... would be like if, if 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 two apps install something that share a, a file that is identical like if, if 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 two apps package the same library and the library contains a, a png for instance something that would be guaranteed to be identical when you install it uh, then that file will be shared between apps, even if, oh, so even that, if it actually deduplicates. Yeah, even, even if the they're completely uh, completely unrelated, it's just a checksum of the file. However, oh, cool. if they if they uh, build the same library, then it depends. Like it depends on the exact. If you're lucky, then it will produce the same binary. And then yeah. it will be shared. I mean, then, then you end up in the, the whole reproducible build yeah, uh, yeah. So that, and, and challenge. We, we do try to make builds reproducible. It helps that we share the entire SDK. So you're guaranteed to use the same compiler, the same linker, the same version of the libraries and whatnot. So it's, but it's still, I mean, it depends on what configure arguments you passed in. And, and you know, we do try to feed in various things that affects uh, reproducibility like this. So 
this magic timestamp value standardized things you can pass in to get reproducible bills. We try to do these things. Uh, so maybe, maybe you get the same binary, maybe not. If you get the same binary, it will be shared. And, and it's interesting in O3, like it's shared when we download it. Like when we're, whenever we're downloading a file, we, we, we know what checksum we're getting. So if it's already local available, there's no need to get it. But also when, when it's used by an application, it's only stored once on disk and, and all the sharing is done using hard links and, and read only bind mounts. So it actually will only be once in page cache also. So the, that's nice. The, even if you even if you have multiple apps running with different runtimes that happen to use the same base runtime, there will only be one copy of libc in in page cache. Wow, cool. I, I guess somebody and that is me <laughs> ought to have <laughs> made better preparations for this one. Okay, this is cool. I, I need to read up a lot. Um, and I get the impression that we're being a bit too nasty with you, but please bear with us. <laughs> yeah. uh, how, how small devices or how, how small is the, like the device you can put this in? So basically what I'm saying, what are the minimal requirements? Well, the, 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 the distribution or the, the run times we're using are kind of large. I think they're about 200 megs or so. Uh, so so th if you're using those, that's the kind of size you're targeting, which is fine if you're ever thinking about you know, a lap running on a laptop or something. But there's nothing fundamentally limiting you to the, using those uh, run times. If you're creating your own run time, it could be arbitrary small. And and the requirements in terms of you know code that runs or memory that's used is is really very small. I I, I don't offhand know the size of the of the Flatpak binary dependency set, but I would be exp I would be surprised if it was more than like a megabyte or so. This is just a small C binary, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. And and then it's all about what what kind of app are you running? How large is the app? How large are the dependencies? We tend to err uh, to adding more to the runtime uh, because the more we have in the runtime, the easier it is for end user like end developers to create their apps without having to bundle all the things. But it's always like a give and take between not wanting the runtime to be bloated and not wanting everyone to maintain every every library as, as a bundle thing. It's the and distro all, problem all, again. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also also the focus on desktop means that you know there, there are naturally a bunch of things in there that are large-ish. Like there's there's a OpenGL implementation, there's an X library, Wayland libraries, the, all the dependencies that just fall out of being a like cute, cute. There's probably like an HTML widget in there, either the GTK or the cute one. So the naturally kind of large set of dependencies. I mean, cute WebKit is the first thing that I couldn't build on a 32-bit machine because the linking yeah. stage couldn't go through. So yeah, then you end up with big stuff. But I mean, how how does the current adoption look? You you see it quite a lot. I. I I do run some things in it just because it wasn't packaged by the by the master distro. Yeah, um, I think so but... it's it's slowly getting a lot of users. Woo! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the infamous uh, signal. I, I, I have a bet with my daughter. She thinks I can get embarrassed by a ringtone. <laughs> it, it doesn't work when you've passed forty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not embarrassed anymore. It's just the uh... so uh, there's just the stats page for Flattop that that lists. So we have around 1,100 apps now on Flattop. Uh, app downloads around 300,000 a day or something. Wow, Ooh, cool. Uh, so so it's, it's it's getting there. I mean. And I mean, the, these are eleven hundred apps. So if you were to to compare it to um, 
to packages in a distro, it's a completely different number because number one, oh, yeah. it hasn't been split, and and these are not the libraries; it's the end user applications. Yeah, yeah. These are like graphical applications, leaf leaf package, if you may if you say. Yeah. Do you mark them as free and open source software versus like proprietary? Uh, we don't. There is there is some like you can list the license and we list them on the web page. Mm -hmm. But but we do we do not hardcore track it. We actually have a like saying saying it's a plans kind of implies that we're currently working on it. But but we have people interested in 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 having it split so that you can tag certain apps as being fully free and then we will expose a uh, a filtered version of flat hub like a free hub or that's what we sometimes call it where, where you would see only the filtered one like the, the the virtual rms style version of the repository and 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 some work has happened on the back end to allow that to happen uh, it's not currently it's not currently finalized but Long term, that's what we want to have. Do Do you see discussions there? Because I mean, that's one of the potentially controversial topics, which is great that you and Red Hat are doing it because nobody would question your sort of open source ethics. But the uh, the what you actually enable is to make it a lot easier to actually build binary only distributed software as well as a consequence of of what you're doing to simplify life. Yeah, or, I mean, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say I do that. It's just I'm just making it easy to distribute a software, and and that's uh, regardless of the license or anything. It's just the fact that it was really hard before affected free software as much as non-free software. But yeah, given that it, that it, it distributions don't package non-free software, and that was the only way realistic to get things to users, it, it does make. Like non binary, non free open or non non free or non open source um, binaries easy to produce uh, or distribute. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a huge issue. I mean, you could always get non free RPMs or non pre devs that that works as well. You know, you can set up a app yeah, it's, it's with clunkier for everyone, developer and and yeah. user, so to speak. It's always hit and miss. I mean, I'm a Debian user, for instance, and you always get the, the Ubuntu style stuff, so you never know. It kind of works mostly. Uh, yeah. That's always the experience. I, you, I, you... I guess the primary difference is the fact that our, uh, that our, uh, our main repository isn't split up by default. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, it's more like we plan to make a split up version of it or a filtered version of it, but, but the main the main product is the combined repository. Yeah. But do you see, do you have any any sort of proprietary or non-open contents now on, on FlatHub? Is it is it something that... We have Skype and Spotify, which are... Yeah. I mean... So yes, <laughs> there are a few they're, of them. They're, not, they're freely distributable, but it's not free software. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, we, have, we have Steam there, and that's very much... Well, I guess partially free, but you know. yeah, but it's very much. I mean, it's yeah. a proprietary thing. Yeah, and I think I guess that's a bit more pragmatic approach than the hardcore uh, distribution method, because a lot of the stuff that people use that hub for is just is the kind of stuff that isn't in the distros. So it it, it is more important for us to be able to ship these things. Than, than it is for a distro, I guess. Yeah. Given your 20 years at Red Hat, and uh, it sounds as if the main focus has been on the desktop, you must have one of the best like skills in <laughs> looking into the future. So what, what do you see in the desktop for the coming years? When is the year of the Linux desktop? Yeah, the Linux, <laughs> when was know. the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> I think I uh, 1999 or something. That's where I started using Linux as my primary desktop. But I don't know. I, I think I think the whole that joke is getting a bit old because the desktop <laughs> is just not that interesting anymore. I mean, 
it used to be that a laptop or a desktop machine is is the primary thing you drive your apps with, and it just isn't anymore because you have phones and pads and other kinds of system. A lot of the stuff even that you do on a on a desktop or laptop is web based. So so we like the need for native native application or the need. The existence of native applications is, is much more limited. And in fact, that kind of drives what kind of applications you're even able to do. A lot of the stuff that's interesting today that are web-based just isn't even possible to do as a desktop because they are collaboratively or, or, or social in a, in a way that, that is really hard to do in a desktop. So uh, I was hoping to get some kind of fight between you and Yuan uh, regarding G GTK versus okay, GT, yeah. but you're saying that none of them are important anymore. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. all web. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Clearly, I'm in the pro GNOME camp being a GNOME developer, but, but I think actually, if you look at Reddit or something, you'd expect that the KDE developers and the GNOME developers to be like, enemies or something but that's just oh. so far from the truth we we all work together and we all like everyone works on stuff that they're interested in but we still share a, an ecosystem we still share a joy for computing for linux for free software we're not we're not enemies in any way yeah, doesn't yeah, necessarily mean uh, doesn't doesn't mean we like just we'll just drop our thing that we spent the last twenty wor years to work on to work on someone else's, but but you know, I'm not mad that someone chooses to spend their time doing work on something else. I thought you were going to say some I'm on crap, but you didn't. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, we we have the the pre desktop collaboration. I think is a good sign of that there is a standardization work ongoing here between the yeah. desktops and a lot of the infrastructure is shared like the um, C group two APIs for launching desktop applications in, in let's call it isolation and not containers because it's not all the yeah, way there but you know and and the standards for 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 you know launching applications desktop files appstream XML they're all called some metadata and and interface <laughs> things that are shared. But yeah, I mean the the UI toolkit might not be the same. It's a matter of what kind of pain you like. Do you like yeah. template based pain or <laughs> boilerplate code type pain? Yeah. <laughs> I actually did a very fun. It must have been in two thousand nine. I did a fun ex experiment uh, when I was with uh, with Nokia. Uh, I actually wrote a GTK header. That was just defines and wrapper functions around cute stuff, uh, and ran all the examples from the from the GTK tutorial, because I mean it, it's all an abstraction of of the X APIs. So we tr there are I think it was around menu actions or something where the abstraction was a bit clunky. So, so you had to to do the whole void pass pointer and recasting back yeah. to to find your footing again. But it's it's very similar. Uh, obviously, the C versus C plus plus part is, makes a large, probably a larger difference than than the actual widget API differences. Yeah, I, I can actually share why uh, why I ended up where I ended up on on, on the Qt side, and, and that's because the true sixty four uh, Unix workstation support for Qt was better in nineteen ninety eight when I started university. I know I built both, and GTK didn't work on 64-bit systems back in the day. So. Well, everything is that way. I mean, if you trace the advent of GNOME in GTK, it all ends up in people wanting to run the GIMP on their university machines, and it needed a license for Motif, which they didn't have, so they wrote their own library to do UI toolkits. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It's this little banana peels in life, and you you slip in one direction. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, in the future, I see. Unfortunately, I say less less desktop stuff. Uh, however, if you look at the current uh, Linux desktops, all of them they are amazing compared to what they used to be. 
Yeah. I mean, pe pe people used to co people complain all the time about changes, but like actually, if you try to use old stuff, it's it, it's yeah. really bad compared to what we have today. <laughs> It's so nice, and it, even for me, I, I like the slick. I'm uh, I am a GNOME user and has been for for so many years. Uh, I like the slickness, but then again, <laughs> I usually fire up a GNOME terminal in full screen mode. <laughs> That's my working day. Yeah. So, what do I need? Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, what what I feel has happened is that the a lot of the corporate stuff that prevented me from being a full time Linux desktop user has gone web. So, I mean, you, you have oh, yeah. uh, Outlook true. and Exchange and all that stuff sitting in the browser now, which actually means yeah. that you can live in, in Linux land. Oh, welcome, another speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I read so up on your listener, profile in a, in, a, in a really old interview, and you said you were a cat person, so that's confirmed now. Yeah, yeah, we, we have two cats. Uh, no, but the the quality of the desktop software in Linux is uh, is really there now. I mean, it's uh, I, I do some Blender and Caden Live stuff uh, for fun on the side, and I mean the the tooling is is mature now. It's uh, it's very useful. It, it, this is actually kind of funny. The I started using free and open source software for some like like what do you say ethical reasons. I, I thought it was a good thing. I still think. But now I'm using it because I think it's way better. It's way fle more flexible, and that wasn't the case in the uh, early years. Yeah, I mean, especially if you, uh, as you said, if you if you was working on a computer, there there was always the set of Windows apps that you have to use internally. But all that tooling turned into web stuff, and then you're basically free to do whatever as long as there's a Chrome or Firefox, you can run it. That's that, why you need to to start talking to other uh, ISAs now. So I got myself a Pine book, and that that felt like a good old time. Some distro hopping, some building some kernels, fighting yeah. with drivers, <laughs> feeling like know. a young engineer again. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> waiting all night for building a new kernel. Yeah, I still remember when I ran Gen 2 and did Emerge KDE, and then you could go do something else for two days or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure those were better days, but they were fun. We were young. <laughs> yeah, we, we had time. Nothing better to do. Exactly. No, but it's, okay. Uh... I guess it's time to wrap this session up. Yeah, I think it's been fun. Uh, thank you for telling us about Flatback. Learned a lot. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, and, and, uh, and a, a small news tidbit, actually, where we're planning to run Foss North uh, end of May this year. Uh, so, so when this episode is up, there will be a landing page online as well for the event. Will it be virtual? So, it depends on the whole corona thing. Uh, yeah. We most conferences start in October in Sweden, at least in Western Sweden. We we checked uh, the calendars with a uh, business suite in Gothenburg. So so we said that uh, we we try to be early. If it works, it works. If we can be outdoors, it works. But it it might be virtual as well. Uh, that will be decided, I think, mid April something, uh, depending on on the contract terms with the venue, how how late we can let cancel basically. I think this is good. We started the recording with talking about the cat command, and now you have a cat in your uh, lap. So I think that concludes today. <laughs> so th thanks a lot. See you again. Thank See you. you. See you.